2024 is the year of reading from my shelves, or at least it's supposed to be. So let's talk about a book that has been sitting on my shelves for a really long time that I recently finished that I absolutely loved. And that is Bryce Head Revisited. Hate this cover though, but I did love this book. Hello book friends, it's Alyssa. Welcome back to the channel. Hello if you are new. And thank you for 2,000 subs. As of recording today, we've hit 2,000 subs. Hopefully it stays there. Sometimes YouTube does things and then my sub count like will just randomly drop and then come back up. I think they like, delete bots or something. But anyway, thank you guys for subscribing. Hello to all the new people. It's a little bit crazy that there are 2,000 people that have subbed to this tiny channel, but I appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you guys wanting to come on the journey that is all of the weird books that I read. Not that the books themselves I read. I just think that I read so broadly sometimes that it feels that as a channel it's a weird thing to subscribe to because everybody else seems to have like a niche and my niche is just books. But anyway, I have had Brideshead Revisited on my bookshelves since whenever this movie tie-in came out. 2008 this came out. It was a long time ago and I've been wanting to read it since before then. I think that I've seen clips of the original sort of 1980s BBC. Was it a miniseries or a movie? But anyway, I've seen that but I've never seen it in its entirety and that gave me one idea of what it was about. And then of course I have seen Saltburn which is I love that movie so much. I think about it all the time. I do need to do a re a rewatch of it soon because it was just, it was so good. It was such a, like a me movie. I loved it visually. It's stunning. I loved the music. I loved the whole story. I loved how bonkers it was. I love the lore around it. I love all the little like Easter eggs and little things that people are coming out with dissecting it. I'm loving all the... TikToks that have come out and reels and videos of people recommending books that are like, if you like Saltburn, you'll like these books. And, or, and, and, and the interviews with the director where she's like, these are the books that is, uh, have inspired the screenplay or whatever. And of course, Brideshead is, is high on that list. I think Brideshead and that Patricia Highsmith book, whose name is escaping me, the talented, the talented Mr. Ripley, I believe are like the highest on those lists of like the books that really inspired the script and fed into the narrative uh, a lot. So that kind of gave me the 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 fire to pick up Brideshead finally and and read it. Also it was one of the books that was on my 23 and 23 which you guys never saw because that was a list just for me and I finally was like you know what I need to read some of those because I think I only read like six of them so I will be quietly covering all of those throughout the year and I may highlight where I'm finally doing that and maybe I'll even share with you the failed 23 in 23 list. If you'd like to see that, let me know below if you want to see the books that I really wanted to read last year that I just ignored. Anyway, <laughs> so I finally picked this up and boy was I happy that I did. Uh, yes, you can see how the themes of Saltburn, the thread of the narrative, kind of follows uh, a lot of the plot of Brideshead and then where it just totally diverges. And then there's a lot of things that for me, having watched that movie and looking back with that context while reading this, ignore Mercy, I'm sorry, <laughs> I think the Amazon guy is here. But looking back with the context of somebody who's a modern reader, who's just watched this movie, reading this book for the first time. I can see how these stories are kind of similar and how they, they aren't. So I guess we'll start with like what is Brideshead and, and kind of how it diverges from Saltburn. And, and I know it's kind of like cheap to compare these two because that's not really how they should be. But like in my mind, they are so connected. And I'm sure that there are other people out there that feel that way because I'm sure there are people that are doing the same thing that have watched the movie and now they are reading Brideshead and they are having sort of their own similar experience kind of jumbling up these two things together in their mind and making connections. So if you are like that, hello, nice to meet you. I know that they should stand separately but in my brain, they are together. Does that make sense? I'm doing a lot of hand gestures. I'm going to stop that. Brideshead follows Charles Ryder, who is reflecting back on his life and his time at Brideshead. It's World War I. He stumbles onto this house that he used to know, and he ends up then taking us, the reader, through this narrative of his time as a young man, this moment that's incredibly fleeting, that time when you are like young and anything is possible and 
you can just experience life like frivolously. You don't have to care so much about like morals and family and any of that. It is so much more about just getting drunk and being with your friends and experience life, experiencing life and like maybe, maybe you learn something along the way. That moment before you have to really grow up and be an adult. And he meets this young man, Sebastian, at Oxford and he is like smitten with him. They are very close. They become very good friends. And in my original understanding, I thought this was always going to be the narrative of like Charles and Sebastian and maybe their love and how it didn't work out and and all of that. And maybe there was some sort of betrayal. And in reality, this became a, a much more moral novel than I thought it was going to be. It took twists and turns that I never thought were going to happen. In reality, it is much more about Charles and Sebastian's sister, Julia, than it is so much about Charles and Sebastian. And in that relationship he has with Julia, there's a lot of discussion of religi religiosity, morals, your obligations, depending on your class. Charles and Julia and Sebastian are all sort of in a different, they're in slightly different class spheres and what is okay for the likes of Sebastian and his family are maybe not necessarily okay for people further down the rungs of the ladder in terms of um, having relationships where your parents are split up and your father is living in Europe with his uh, mistress. The idea of having a mixed faith re uh, relationship in terms of being Protestant or Catholic. I didn't know that this was going to deal so much with religion and perhaps because I have my own you know qualms with religion in general. Uh, I, I focused in a little bit too much on that but I don't think so. I feel like Charles is this very he's a very outspoken for the times atheist and he gets wrapped up in this family that's incredibly religious and like a lot of Sebastian's issues stem from I think his guilt around a lot of different things. So Seb Sebastian ends up turning to drink and his frivolous party young man life takes that dip towards being addiction and ruination of your life. And a lot of that I think comes from his own like internalized guilt from being raised so Catholic by his such a Catholic mother. Like his mother is so Catholic. Like they have their own chapel and the, there's a lot of uh, discourse around how how that that has to go because you know times are changing and they can't maintain this chapel and the priest can't come and be there and that's a big part of their way of life and meanwhile like her husband's living with another woman in in Italy there's a just a lot of social commentary that's happening specifically around religion at the time and morals of the time but also just this fleeting time between world wars where you're kind of st still very firmly holding on to the old ways that were erased pretty much by World War I, but they haven't gone completely out. A lot of these big houses with big staffs and, you know, we saw it on Downton Abbey and all of that. This is a, this is a concept I think that we are, that we are familiar with. But this idea of having the big house and living that life that you've been living for generations is harder and harder to hold on to. And we do see that throughout the narrative, you see how people have to sell their homes and Charles becomes this person that makes these beautiful portraits of these homes that are sold or turned into this side or the other thing or people are now living in tiny pieces of a house that they used to live in the entirety of it because they, they cannot afford it and it's now being used as another venture and they become these pieces that people cherish because they are holding on to that, that that past that heritage of their family that that they've had to say goodbye to and this beautifully captures this moment in between wars this time of um, recapturing youth and frivolity after World War One, holding on to old ways of how firmly people held on to beliefs and how important the distinction is between being Protestant and Catholic. As I was reading it, I had a lot of foreboding for Sebastian. I thought for sure Sebastian was going to have something absolutely horrendous happen to him and he does have several near misses and he does sort of fade into the background of the narrative, which I found shocking. Um, and he does 
pop back up and we do learn more about him and it is sad but also i feel like it could have been worse for sebastian he does sort of find a way of falling back on his feet uh through the help of the religion that i think gave him all the guilt and sort of led to his addictive behaviors that that he turned to in, for coping. Editing Alyssa here. I think it's also important to note that one of Sebastian's biggest fears and why he spent so much time trying to keep Charles from meeting his family is that he has kind of this fear that somehow the family is going to take something away from him and that something might be Charles. And that kind of does come to pass like through being introduced into the family and through many events, there does become this divide where Sebastian and Charles are no longer as close as they once were. And the reality is that that is more to do with Sebastian and his addiction than it does anything to do with specifically his family. And then, you know, Charles does try to hold on to Sebastian and help him through his addiction for a very long time. And that doesn't really go well. Sebastian just kind of never escapes his alcoholism and the repercussions of that. But through all of this, Charles ends up becoming deeply entrenched within the family. So in some ways, those fears that Sebastian had were validated, but they really weren't in the ways that perhaps he originally feared. They came about through different means. But yeah, that the, I forgot to talk about that whole dynamic between them and that fear of of Sebastian's, of even introducing somebody that he cared so deeply about to the family, um, lest the family just like take that thing he cares about away. But yeah, back to this rambling <laughs> mess of a review. But I was very surprised by the the romance between Charles and Julia. I did not expect that to become part of the plot just from the very little bit that I had seen of the early film um, when I was probably like a teenager. I had always had this idea that this was this like incredibly queer narrative and though it is very like queer normative in a lot of ways with some of the characters which is refreshing to read from a classic but trust me it still had its moments of being you know racist and anti-semitic and all the things that we're used to from from classics it was nice to see this this little bit of um queer normativeness coming through or poking through the story but i was expecting that kind of narrative so to have this flip and to have this this change to a story about Charles and Julia was interesting and I was very intrigued to see where it went and it's an interesting way that it ends and I don't want to spoil everything because I feel like just saying that, that Charles and Julia have a little bit of a, a, a relationship is very spoilery. I, I, I really enjoy this. I, I think I want to go back and read it again after reading some more critique because I was looking up things and it looks like there's a lot of blogs that break down the text and the references in all of it uh, really beautifully but I was looking things up like different paintings and different Latin phrases and things that get discussed throughout the book so that I could better understand what was referencing. I couldn't help but see how different plot points in Saltburn kind of pull through, um, like there was an overarching story arc that that kind of sets the frame for then the, the movie to just twist and diverge and make this really sinister and murderous story out of this other story which is weirdly like about morality and changing times. I just think they're very interesting together to to watch and then read and I and I would wonder if anybody else has has gone on this journey as well where they've watched the movie and maybe read Brightside for the first time or read it again for the first time in a long time and have 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 had those moments of you know like obviously meeting at college and having this obsession with uh another boy and being brought home to a different stratosphere of of society and being kind of welcomed into the fold of that family and that's kind of where things start to diverge between Saltburn and Brideshead you know in Saltburn that being brought into the family becomes this setup for this very murderous devious uh depraved narrative whereas Brideshead takes a like the opposite direction it becomes tragic but also very much rooted in this moral dilemma that's kind of going on between um, Julia and Charles and 
different aspects of their families and different aspects of their lives and what is your obligation as a woman you know you must get married so you get married and you do things to meet those obligations because that's what the society wants of you and you know you're still rooted in this very rigid society between world wars and it's much more traditional obviously it is a classic. It's, it's a much more traditional narrative than Saltburg, but I, I, this is a little, this is very rambly and I'm very sorry, but I absolutely, I just loved this so much. And I, it's the kind of book that I'm going to go back to. And I do have a little list in my book journal, which I've been holding up for me to go back and watch both Brideshead movies, but also to go back and watch Saltburn after doing that. And, and really being able to see the little, bits of influence that the book has had in this movie that I really loved. And I and I kind of love how you can take classic books and you can, I love when movies take things from classic books and classic literature and they spin them and they don't just make a remake and they make something that is familiar but different. And, and I, I absolutely love that. And I want more of that. So if you have other things like that, please tell me in the comments if there are like classic books that have been influences for a movie. Not that it remakes the book, but you can see how the screenwriters have taken bits and been influenced by those stories that are well known and, and beloved and have turned them into something new that is phenomenal. I mean, I do love a good remake. I mean, I think about things like 10 Things I Hate About You, um, and Taming of the Shrew, or Mean Girls, and, um, no, not Mean Girls, and um, Clueless, sorry, and Emma. Um, there's lots of things like that, which I do enjoy too, but this is like that next step further. We're not remaking it or making it modern or doing anything like that. We are compiling some incredibly great narratives and putting them in sort of a mixing bowl and turning them up and coming out with a new narrative in a different format that is really compelling and wonderful and I and I personally loved. I know it's not for everybody, but I loved it. So yes, I read Brideshead, I loved it. I need to reread it again because uh, I, I want to do a deeper dive into this after doing more research and reading of different people's vlogs and videos and things where they really break down the text because there is so much in here. There's so much commentary on the time, on this moment in a life, uh, on that moral dilemma. Loved it. Please go ahead and read this. If you've never read this, please read Brideshead. I think it's so good. I mean, with any classic, you get that warning of there's probably going to be something that is not worded the way we would like it to be worded, but you kind of have to take that in stride. I will be going on my journey of watching Brideshead and rewatching Saltburn, but I absolutely loved this. It's a beautiful book that captures a, a very specific moment in time, uh, a moment of flux, a moment of change, and really highlights what that would be like, what that was like. And I think that's what makes a really great classic novel is they capture moments in time, like they're caught in amber. And I, I absolutely love this. So please go ahead and read this. I'm gonna stop rambling. I'm sorry if this review is crazy, <laughs> but again, thank you guys for 2,000 subscribers. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe and I'll see you in my next video, whatever it may be, because it's my channel and I can do whatever I want. Just sit with me Talking to the night until the morning Building cat mystery I don't think I ever want to go Come closer next to me Trying to find another way to say this But I think, I think We were meant to be